In the Washington Post, uh, it's breaking news that it uh, reveals another broad and secret U.S. government surveillance program. The Washington Post uh, and The Guardian in London reporting that the NSA and the FBI are tapping directly into the uh, central servers of nine leading Internet companies, including Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, AOL, Skype, YouTube, and Apple. The Post says they're extracting audio, video, photographs, emails, documents, and connection logs that enable analysts to track a person's movements and contacts over time. Uh, let's discuss this latest revelation that's coming out. Thanks for having me. Um, if anybody has any questions, like I said, just basically just raise your hand, and I'll try to call on you as soon as I possibly can. So who here actually feels like they are under surveillance pretty regularly? Everyone inside of Occupy. How many people here have been arrested and had their at their court date they had their phone taken into the back room? How many people here had their retina scanned? Wow. Um, so you guys are actually, in a sense, the canaries in the coal mine, right? Because the incentives are all lined up against you. Anybody see on the subway link your metro card to your debit card? Right? And like auto refill? This is a concept which is key to everything we'll talk about today. And it's called linkability. Take one piece of data and link it to another piece of data. So for example, if you have your Metro card and you have your debit card, you have those things and you can draw a line between them, right? So that's like not a scary thing, except your bank card is tied to everything else that you do during the day. So now they know where you're going, when you make purchases. So when they decide to target you, they can actually recreate your exact steps with a Metro card and with the credit card alone. Like literally where you go and what you buy and potentially, by linking that data with other people on similar travel plans, they can figure out who you talked to and who you met with. When you then take cell phone data, which logs your location, and you link up purchasing data, metro card data, and your debit card, you start to get what you could call metadata in aggregate over a person's life. And metadata in aggregate is content. It tells a story about you, which is made up of facts, but is not necessarily true. So for example, just because you were on the corner and all those data points point to it, it doesn't mean you committed the crime. So it's important to note that if someone has a perception of you having done a thing, it will now follow you for the rest of your life. So just keep... Actually, given, given your sort of you know, geographic uh, familiarity with the UK and whatnot, I'd like to point out that GCHQ um, has... Uh, Probably the most invasive uh, uh, well yeah. <laughs> uh, network intercept program anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's called Tempora, T E M P O R A, and it's the world's first full take. They call it, and that means content in addition to metadata on everything. Um, so th this. I want to give you kind of a quick tour. Uh, when Laura was looking at this, she was kind of salivating and couldn't stop, like actually reading the documents. Right, right, right. So we'll try um, and restrain ourselves yeah, without right. promising that we'll succeed. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of explain a, a brief overview of, of what these are and how they're organized. Um, the beginning are just some documents of interest. Uh, the primary purpose of the second archive is to bring the focus over to SSO. As opposed to uh, PRISM, and this this is in general. Uh, it's SSO or Special Source Operations. Those are the worldwide passive uh, collection on networks. They're both domestic to the U.S. and international. There's a lot of different ways they do it, but uh, corporate partnerships are one of the primary things uh, they do domestically. They also do this with multinationals that might be headquartered in the U.S. who they can kind of coerce or just pay into giving them access. Uh, and they also do it bilaterally with the assistance of certain governments. And that's basically on the premise that they go, all right, we'll help you set the system up if you give us all the data from it. Um, so yeah, kind of how these uh, capabilities ramp up in sophistication over time. And this is kind of nice. As of fiscal year 2011, they could monitor one billion telephone or internet sessions simultaneously per one of these devices. Uh, and they could collect at the rate of about 125 gigabytes a second. Uh, which is a tear of bit. That's just second. each one of these devices. That's for each one of these, yeah. Um, How many tumult missions would that be then? Uh, per this, back then, there were 20 sites. There's 10 at DOD installations. But these are all outdated. We've expanded pretty rapidly. Uh, but still 20 sites, that's at least 20 billion. This these all needs to get out. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it just in terms of understanding 
the yeah. capabilities. Like it, it's so okay. It's not science fiction. Mas já amanhã vai ser na internet, não? Meia noite. Sim. Oh, quero te mostrar o, o documento novo tá. agora. Você vai ver isso muito mais claramente do que essa. Essa está o mapa que o cabos que eles onde eles estão coletando os dados para a prisão. Uhum. Aqui mostra quantos eles estão coletando. O mais grosso ou linha, ou mais quantidade eles estão coletando. Você pode ver aqui o, o linhas, o cabos é bem grosso para Brasil na sul e o norte o cabos na mar do Brasil. Ele mostra que eles estão coletando muitas coisas no programa Prism, que eu acho que é muito importante porque Prism é Facebook, e Skype, YouTube, Yahoo, Hotmail e mostra muito trânsito sendo roubado do Brasil. Mas não sabemos quanto o governo brasileiro sabe e quanto colaboração eles têm com empresas brasileiras também. Não sabemos disso, mas vamos saber, acho. Um dia saberemos tudo, com quase tudo. É. Uma palavra de vossa senhoria pelo tempo que julgar necessário. Sim, sim, obrigado. E boa tarde a todos. A uh, primeira coisa, o justificação para os americanos, para tudo, desde o ataque de 11 de setembro, é terrorismo. Tudo para a segurança nacional, para proteger nossa população. Na realidade, é o oposto. Tem muito, muito documentos que não tem nenhum ressonamento com nada sobre terrorismo ou segurança nacional, mas só sobre competição com outro país, outras empresas industrial, financial, econômica. A segunda coisa sobre o X-Key Score. Quando publicamos os primeiros, segunda, terceiro artigos, o defesa do governo americano está, não estamos invadindo o conteúdo ou comunicação, só o metadados, ou, ou os fatos sobre ou a identidade, sobre com quem você está falando, o que está falando ligando para você, a duração da comunicação. Na realidade, se eu posso saber todas as pessoas com quem você está comunicando e todas as pessoas com quem elas estão comunicando, e onde você fica quando você está comunicando e o duração e o local eu posso saber muito sobre sua personalidade sua atividade, sua vida é, é, é um vazal grande na privacidade mas na realidade essa defesa é totalmente falsa o governo americano tem capacidade para invadir não só o metadados, mas o coisa que você está falando dentro do e-mail, ou coisa que você está falando na telefone, ou as palavras que você está entrando na Google para pesquisas coisas na internet, qual website você está visitando, ou os documentos que você está mandando para colegas. Esse sistema vai mostrar quase tudo que todas as pessoas estão fazendo na internet. Então, se você é um jornalista fazendo uma investigação do governo americano, ou se você trabalha com uma empresa que está dando competição grande para uma empresa americana, ou se você está alguém que trabalha com direitos humanos contra o governo americano, ou qualquer muitas outras coisas, eles podem invadir essas comunicações com muita facilidade. Se você é americano, morando nos Estados Unidos, eles precisam ir primeiro para o tribunal e, dar, e, e pedir permissão sempre receber. Mas se você não é americano, eles não precisam nada, nenhuma aprovação do quadro para fazer isso. Eu acho que as consequências da eliminação da privacidade é difícil às vezes para analisar, mas está muito importante para entender que essa vai ter um impacto grande ou habilidade para a população para fazer manifestações, para fazer organização política contra o governo é diminuído muito quando está sem privacidade. Recent reports have revealed that the NSA have access to encryption keys and they paid tech companies to introduce backdoors in encryption protocols. So we are going to talk about ways in which we can defend ourselves against governments spying on us.
So I'm Mr. Jacob Applebaum is an encryption and security software developer and journalist. Ladar Levison is the founder of the encrypted email service LavaBit, used by Edward Snowden. You have the floor. Thank you. LavaBit is an email service that hopefully one day will be able to um, stand on its own without any references to Snowden. <laughs> My service was designed to remove me from the possibility of being forced to violate a person's privacy. Quite simply, LavaBit was designed to remove the service provider from the equation. By not having logs on my server and not having access to a person's emails on disk, I wasn't eliminating the possibility of surveillance. I was simply removing myself from that equation in that surveillance would have to be conducted on the target either the sender or the receiver of the messages. But I was approached by the FBI quite recently and told that because I couldn't turn over the information from that one particular user, I would be forced to give up those SSL keys and let the FBI collect every communication on my network without any kind of transparency. And of course, I wasn't comfortable with that, to say the least. Um, more disturbing was the fact that I couldn't even tell anybody that it was going on. So I decided if I didn't win the fight to unseal my case, if I didn't win the battle to be able to tell people what was going on, then my only ethical choice left was to shut down. Think about that. I believe in the rule of law. I believe in the need to conduct investigations. But those investigations are supposed to be difficult for a reason. It's supposed to be difficult to invade somebody's privacy because of how intrusive it is, because of how disruptive it is. If we can't, if we don't have our right to privacy, how do we have a free and open discussion? What good is the right to free speech if it's not protected? in the sense that you can't have a private discussion with somebody else about something you disagree with. Think about the chilling effect that that has. Think about the chilling effect it does have on countries that don't have a right to privacy. I've noticed a really interesting discussion point, which is that what people used to call liberty and freedom, we now call privacy. And we say, in the same breath, that privacy is dead. This is something that really concerns me about my generation, especially when we talk about how we're not surprised by anything. I think that we should consider that when we lose privacy, we lose agency, we lose liberty itself, because we no longer feel free to express what we think. There's this myth of the passive surveillance machine, but actually what is surveillance except control? This notion that the NSA are passive, this is nonsense. What we see is that they actively attack European citizens, American citizens, and in fact, anyone that they can if they perceive an advantage.